I share with you this morning a reading from the Gospel according to Luke, the 24th chapter, beginning in the 36th verse. Jesus stood among the disciples and said to them, Peace be with you. They were terrified. They were afraid. They thought they were seeing a ghost. Jesus said to them, Why are you startled? Why are doubts arising in your hearts? Look at my hands and my feet. Touch me and see. A ghost doesn't have flesh and bones like you see I have. As he said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. They were wondering and questioning in the midst of their happiness. He said to them, do you have anything to eat? And they gave him a piece of baked fish. Jesus took it and he ate it in front of them. Jesus then said to them, these are my words that I have spoken to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and in the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. He said to them, this is what is written, that Christ will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and a change of heart and life for the forgiveness of sins must be preached in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. And then a reminder of a quote from Pope John Paul II that I shared with you on Easter Sunday morning. He said, do not abandon yourselves to despair. We are Easter people and Alleluia is our song. Will you pray with me? In the course of our busy lives, Almighty God, you grant us times of rest and spiritual refreshment. Grant that we may use such times as these to perceive the ways in which you are calling to us. And then grant us the strength and the courage to pursue those things and accomplish them. We ask that in these moments you will open our eyes and open our ears, open our minds, that we will discover more completely who you are and what you are calling us to be and to do. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. When I was in music school, one of my voice professors had a beautifully framed phrase that hung proudly on the wall in his studio, just above the grand piano. It was centrally located in the room so that every student saw it during every lesson. The phrase was a simple one. It simply read, life is a song, sing it. It's a rather fitting message to be enshrined in a voice professor's studio, don't you think? But what does the phrase mean, particularly outside of the voice studio? I never took the time to analyze the phrase during my student days. I'm not sure, even now, that it's a phrase worthy of analysis, to be honest. But my curiosity was piqued recently when I was reading through a quotation book and discovered that the phrase from the voice studio is the opening phrase of a larger quotation attributed to an Indian spiritual master who died in 1918 named Sai Baba of Shirdi. He was a revered teacher of spiritual disciplines in both the Hindu and Muslim traditions. This is the larger quote. Life is a song, sing it. 
Life is a game. Play it. Life is a challenge. Meet it. Life is a dream. Realize it. Life is a sacrifice. Offer it. Life is love. Enjoy it. An intriguing set of phrases, wouldn't you agree? Each phrase rehearses a message that inspires and motivates the reader or the listener to live life to the fullest. Mother Teresa must have found Sai Baba's phrase interesting enough that she too borrowed it. Life is a song, sing it, she said. But she also added another line. Life is a struggle, accept it. I wonder if Mother Teresa or Sai Baba had any influence on Pope John Paul and his analogy of Alleluia being the song to sing about Easter. After all, John Paul was a lifelong lover of music and the arts. In fact, in his early years as a parish priest in Krakow, he frequently attended concerts, art galleries, and museums as he began to explore his passion for working with musicians and artists to bring people together to experience the arts, particularly for those folks who were living with conflict in Poland and Eastern Europe. Music became for then the Cardinal, a catalyst to gather people and then engage them in discussion and negotiation. John Paul carried his discovery into his papacy. The Pope often hosted great classical music concerts in St. Peter's Basilica with the express purpose of bringing together the Jewish, Islamic, and Christian leaders from around the world. The goal was to let music build a bridge to understand one another while working to diminish conflict in the world. One of the most fascinating books that I have ever read is written by Sir Gilbert Levine, a Jewish American musician who became the conductor of the Krakow Symphony, the home of the archdiocese served by Cardinal Karol Wotila before he became Pope. The book is titled the Pope's Maestro. It is a chronicle of the relationship between that Jewish conductor and the Pope of the Roman Church. I want to share with you two short paragraphs from the final page of Maestro Levine's book. He wrote, My 17 years of working with John Paul taught me many things. First, it taught me about the power of music and spirit. It fosters hope and transformation and healing and love. Second, it has taught me about the mystery of faith. Not one faith, but three. Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. And third, I have learned the potential for reconciliation and redemption in the face of conflict, sadness, and sometimes violence in both the past and the present. My music making is now different than it was. I am more patient. I listen for the stillness as well as the roar. I look for the story in the music that needs to be told. I have learned to discover the meaning beneath the surface of the notes. I know now that music is spirit that has become sound. Music has the power to make us whole and to bring us peace. I want to lift for our consideration this morning one sentence. 
He wrote, I look for the story in the music that needs to be told. That value focused statement written by the conductor came from one simple phrase that the Pope used in addressing all the musicians who had gathered and the Pope gave them a pre-concert speech. In his speech, the Pope declared to the chorus and orchestra, make the story sing. Make the story sing. Pope John Paul put a Lucan spin to his music analogy. Discover the story and then make it sing. You see, Easter people, people of faith who believe in the resurrection message, have a song to sing. They have a witness to share. The song is not one of despair, but rather a song of hope. According to John Paul, the text of that Easter song is Alleluia, a song of praise. For years now, I have wondered if Luke was a physician who was also a musician. It's actually quite common for doctors to be musicians. I have a friend in Lansing who was a marvelously gifted emergency room physician who was also a marvelously gifted jazz pianist. And over time, he became a well-published classical music composer. One of my best friends in Springfield, Missouri, plays trombone in a jazz combo of physicians. There was a Dixieland jazz ensemble when I was in music school whose members were faculty members from both the School of Music as well as the medical school. It's true, there's something about the discipline of medicine that seems to be compatible with the discipline of music. We all know it. We sing our way through the Christmas season with Luke. Where would the nativity story be without the music of Luke? There's the Magnificat, or Mary's song. There is the Benedictus, or the song of Zacharias. There is the Gloria in Excelsis, which is the angelic song of praise. And there is the Nunc Dimittis, Simeon's prayerful song of peace. The way Luke wrote his gospel, there was a melodic and rhythmic flavor to nearly every story. Through the stories of Jesus as told by Luke, each story seemed to have a point and a counterpoint, harmony and dissonance, varied tempos and dynamic contrasts with a structure unlike any other gospel writer. Why, the four stories that Luke told in the last chapter of his gospel was like a four-movement symphony. He began with the empty tomb, followed by an encounter between Jesus and two travelers on the road to Emmaus, the rehearsal of the appearances of the resurrected Jesus that then culminated with the story of the ascension and the assurance from Jesus that God's spirit would be with them always. In movement three, which I read to you earlier, I want you to listen once more to the picturesque language. Listen to the rhythm. Listen to the power of the song that Luke is singing and see if it doesn't invite you in to the story. Jesus stood among the disciples. He said, peace be with you. They were terrified. They were afraid. They thought they were seeing a ghost. And then he said to them, why are you startled? Why are doubts arising in your hearts? Look at my hands and my feet. Touch me and see. A ghost doesn't have flesh and bones like you see that I have. And as he said this, he showed them his hands and feet. 
They were wondering. They were questioning in the midst of their happiness. Jesus said to them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And then he concluded by saying this, you are witnesses of these things. You are witnesses of these things. Let that phrase just rest with you a moment. Phrased another way, you are singers of the song. But as the singers of God's song, it's up to each of us to discover the meaning of the text so that there is no distance whatsoever between the story and our story. Like a musical interpreter that lives with the music carefully and fully enough to discover the nuances of the text and the melody and the harmony and the rhythm and the mood, so we are invited to become witnesses that interpret the story of God's love and grace and presence made real to our world through the resurrection story. Easter is the song we sing. Now we've got to sing it. You know, after all these years, I wish I could go to that music professor and tell that professor after, after all this time just how much that phrase in his studio has come to mean to me. Life is a song. Sing it. Thank you for joining us in worship this day. Wherever you are, whatever you find yourself doing this day, we trust that God has been real for you and that something that has transpired in our worship service has meant something meaningful to you. Let me take you back to that full quotation from Sai Baba. Life is a song, sing it. Life is a game, play it. Life is a challenge, meet it. Life is a dream, realize it. Life is a sacrifice, offer it. Life is love, enjoy it. Today, may God's love and grace and peace be with us in all that we say, do, and think. And may God's love surround us and give us peace. Amen.